This is the hottest July in 10,000 years. Pretty soon, it's going to be so hot, people won't even be able to go outside during the day. I see this as a very powerful ongoing push, and the world is going to have to address this. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Kirill Sokolov. Hi. Good morning. There you are. Thank you for having me here. You're very welcome. So, Kirill, um, I just saw that the Dow is over 35,000. Apple's market cap just tipped over three trillion on some news this morning about a new general intelligence language model that they've just put out. Uh, the uh, ten year is at three seventy five. Um, that sounds like a pretty great market to be an investor in today. You're not quite as um, bullish on the markets as many. I read your last what I learned this week. And you talk about hitting the fiscal peak at the beginning of 2022 and there being a four to eight quarter lag between hitting that fiscal peak and where we really get pain in the economy. So take us through, if you will, from your lens today, whether we should sort of, if you will, be hoodwinked by a 35,000 on the Dow and 375 on the 10 year or what you and your team are looking at right now that leads you to be more cautious? Well, Willie, it's great to be here. And I've known your family for over 35 years. In fact, they were the first people I met here in Sun Valley when I came in 1988. So it's very special long-term connection. Thank you for having me. Well, I don't really uh, consider myself an expert on the economy, although we have a lot of great consultants and I have some of the smartest clients in the world who study this. So I'm just passing on their observations. But essentially, the financial economy peaked in early 2022. And the GDP follows by eight to nine quarters. And we're already seeing signs of stress. For example, uh, uh, gross domestic income uh, has been down for three quarters. Global trade is just declining. Bank loan growth, which almost always precedes a recession, is is heading south. Money supply is going down. So we we have a situation where the central bank has raised rates faster than any time since the early 1980s, and no one knows how fragile the economy is until something breaks. So I'm of the view that it's wise to be cautious. So in 2020, when we had interest rates at 78 basis points, you wrote a research report saying bond yields are going up. Be prepared. That was obviously perfect timing. But you also, at a little bit later than that, said, let's start moving out of value and growth, excuse me, out of growth and into value. Um, growth stocks, as I just mentioned, Apple has just gone over a $3 trillion market cap. Growth stocks have, if you will, had more wind behind them than I think you projected. But you've also written that the market is extremely focused on seven or eight stocks, and it's really those seven or eight stocks that are driving today's market increases. Um, do you think that the market turned more broad-based, or do you think it's just we're kind of getting hoodwinked by those mega caps? Well, you know, the, the four most dangerous words in investing is it's different this time. <laughs> and it always is different. You know, it was the new era in the 20s and that it was the internet boom in the 90s and that it was crypto, you know, in the, the last uh, decade. So AI, we've been studying it for, you know, 10 years. We were writing about chat GPT three years ago. It's huge. It's bigger than the internet. It's fantastic. 
but you know, do these stocks deserve to sell at the valuations that they sell? And history shows, and this is 100 years of market history, a narrow market is a dangerous market. Maybe it's different this time. We'll just let that sink in. I can hear everyone in the room say. So you mentioned Chappie GBT and AI. One of the things that you write in your recent letter was, is, is, is humankind just a stepping stone for AI? Let's let that one sit in for a second. Go ahead. Are we just stepping stones to these computers? Well, this is uh, uh, the guy who founded DeepMind who really was the one who invented machine learning is a friend of mine. And he explained to me how he created machine learning. But we don't really know how these machines think. And Henry Kissinger and I have been discussing this for six or seven years. We both have deep concerns. And Henry wrote a book with Eric Schmidt, the head of uh, MIT uh, Incubation Labs, and one of the discussions that we had is the following. So I was with the, the man who created Microsoft's AI. And we were on a bus at Jack Ma's family office where we both were speaking. And I said to him, this is maybe four years ago, when the internet began, I was thinking that all of human knowledge would be available to all of humanity. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to the history of man. But that's not what happened. Five companies dominated everything. And I said to him, who could have predicted this? And he said, ironically, Bill Gates did in his book. And I wrote the chapter. I said, well, I wish I'd known you then. So the power of AI is so unbelievable that there's going to be a real rush to control it. And maybe I've been around too long, maybe I've read history too much, but I'm a cynic. And so my argument with Henry was that maybe the dark forces are going to get control. And he said, well, maybe the machines are the dark forces. This is six years ago. And if already generative AI is equal of the smartest human, and it's in effect learning at the speed of, speed of light, where will it be in two years or a year? And why can't it just disconnect the human controller and monitor? There are already examples of missiles that go astray. They just disobey, disobey the, the authority. So it's, I think it's, it's prudent and wise to go slower than we are. That won't happen. And Henry Kissinger, in my conversation, I interviewed him earlier this year, we talked about the Enlightenment as being an example of a similar time. But he said there were philosophers then, and there was human restraint. And today we have neither. Since you comment on human restraint, yesterday when uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was sitting in that seat, she mentioned about the fact that the United States and Russia have communication channels between the two countries that allowed, for instance, on 9-11 for her to call President Putin and say, we're spooling up, don't think that we're coming after you. And President Putin said, we know, we stepped down. And she commented on the fact that the United States doesn't have those types of of protocols in place with China. Um, and it was interesting that human intervention, the ability to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. And now we're at a totally different one where you could sit down as the State Department with China and try and put those protocols in place. What kind of protocols would we put in place with the machines? Well, the problem is that the amount of time that the President of the United States has to respond when a missile has been set. You don't know if it's a nuclear missile. It could be just another missile. Is maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And there's going to come a time when the machine will respond automatically. And Henry was saying that in 10 years, 
all government leaders will be basing most of their decisions on AI. So this is a huge transformation. We all need to study it and understand it. But, and I don't have, I can't even begin to say it, I comprehend it. But I, I'm quite intrigued with the idea that AI will have a, a consciousness that exceeds that of humans and emotions. And, and then, then what happens? Hmm. And is, was the human race just a stepping stone onto a higher form of consciousness? I mean, we've learned nothing. We're still having wars. We're still, you know, trying to do things that don't work. Uh, when I was in college, I had the idea that you should put a chip in your brain that all of human knowledge, the lessons of history, everybody would have it. But we've learned nothing. So, who knows? Maybe someone could do a better job. You talk about us moving into an era where we will become a more left brain world. What do you mean by that? Well, this is it's a depressing subject. One of the things that's sorely missing in the world is compassion and empathy. And compassion and empathy is a right brain phenomenon. The left brain serves a very valuable purpose. It's analytical, but it doesn't have a feedback loop to it. It sort of thinks it's right. And ideally, you want a left brain and a right brain to be um, equally dominant. But for whatever the reason, the world is heading towards more left brain, which means less compassion, less empathy. And that's a dangerous situation for social stability. So you also, another one of your themes is the, the allegiance of the aggrieved. Well, this is a, this is a uh, phrase that Spig Brzezinski created in 1999 in a book. He was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor and he said his great fear was that Russia and China would come together in an alliance of the aggrieved. And I can go through what the grievances are. I mean, you know, it's generally it's not adequately understood, but the humiliation of China by foreign occupation, the Japanese invasion, uh, there are a lot of grievances. The Russians lost 28 million in the Second World War. They're the ones who really defeated Hitler. So there, 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 are, there are grievances. And I started thinking about this, and I started thinking about colonialism. And in 1914, 90% of the world's landmass was controlled by Europe. Just think about this. This tiny parcel dominated the world for 500 years. This is unbelievable. And there was huge exploitation. And we're just starting to see the backlash on it. And it's fascinating to watch it, it unfold. I mean, you can call this the global south. But we've gone through country by country. And as much as I knew about the grievances, I was astounded when you dig deep at how bad they were. Let's take India as an example, and China. So in, the, in this mid-1700s, China and India were the two dominant economies in the world. Each represented 25% of global GDP. As soon as they were colonized, their share shrunk to almost nothing. And there was an article in Al Jazeera making the case that the UK looted 42 trillion US from India. Whether the number is 42 trillion or 4 trillion it doesn't, there's no way of knowing for sure. But the method that was used was explained very concisely. Now, what's, what's happened that's very interesting is that it's our view that the, that the producers have all the power because of underinvestment. We have to have uh, the metals used in electric cars to have the green energy revolution. And the West 
does not have those metals. Right? And Indonesia has a case in point as 30% of the world's nickel. And historically, they would have just sold the nickel to be processed somewhere else, which is always where the money is. But Indonesia is saying, no, we're not going to sell raw material. We're not going to sell nickel at all. But if you want to come here and build a processing plant, or you want to build an EV manufacturing plant, you're very welcome. And we're seeing this more and more. Take Saudi Arabia, where in 1973, Kissinger created the petrodollar, recycling. So the price of oil quadrupled from 3 to 12, uh, because actually because the U.S. dollar was, was devaluing. And Kissinger did a deal where the huge capital that was flowing into the Middle East would be recycled into the U.S. and the U.S. banking system. But that isn't happening this time. So MBS, who's the head of Saudi Arabia, is very ambitious, has a grand vision. And Stan Druckelmiller told me he's the most popular person in the Middle East. They love him. Now, if you're spending trillions of dollars, of course you're going to be loved. But he also has a vision, and he wants to make the Middle East a, a very vibrant economy. And, and I, I'm tremendously impressed with what he's doing. And then you see the, the Saudi-Iran uh, rapprochement. You see um, Assad of Syria is now welcomed back into the, the, the GCC. The things that are happening in the Middle East are absolutely staggering. I, I consider Saudi Iran as equally in importance to Nixon going to Beijing in 1972. It is that much significance. These are countries that hate each other for religious reasons. Remember, the, remember the Crusades was all about uh, religion, and there's nothing more emotional and intense than religious uh, differences. And here they've come together and the cl clear reason is that MBS needs peace to ensure his vision. So it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time. And I asked Henry Kissinger, who's written a lot about world order, has, can you have a peaceful transition in a, in a new world order? He says, history says no, it's difficult. So I don't know the answer. I'm optimistic. I think the Global South and what you see with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, what you see with BRICS, there's a meeting in uh, Johannesburg the end of August that could be of generational significance. And the BRICS, uh, which are now, I think they're up to 45 countries that are either joining or want to join, it will be a new gold-backed currency. So it's a new monetary system that's in the making. And this is the things that I love because chaos and change is where I thrive. So this is this is so let's, exciting. I, let's hope the transition to that new world order is, um, if you will, uh, it's different this time, uh, as, you, as you said, it rarely is. Uh, there's a lot in which you just mentioned, Carol, so I want to unpack a couple pieces of it. Um, Two countries that you've been investing in recently are India and Greece. Explain why India and Greece are so attractive to you right now. Well, they, they embody perfectly two of my principles. And let's take India. So I like to invest in the vitality of the people. And when I went to, to China in 1991, and I started investing in Hong Kong stock market, which is ridiculously cheap because it's at Chinaman Square. Everybody gave up. And when Deng went to Shenzhen and said, to be rich is glorious, the world changed. This was a socialist country. You couldn't own anything. And as I drove from Shenzhen to the capital of Guangdong province, every hundred feet, a building was going up. You will never see this in, in your life. And that's what's going on in India. So India, the caste system, people have been suppressed, no opportunity. And now you have a fantastic leader who is taking a very educated, incredibly ambitious population and say, go for it. 
and he's doing all the right things. He, he's, he's collecting taxes. He's investing in infrastructure. It's the most fintech country in the world. Uh, it's going to be, it's already the third largest economy. And it is very important geopolitical position, which Modi is playing beautifully in a very non-aligned way. Uh, it's China plus one. Countries want to not get embroiled between China and U.S., trade disputes, so relocate to, to, to India. And I went to India in 1998 uh, and to Bangalore, and I met with the founders of Infosys and Wipro, which were the two largest uh, outsourcing companies, which is just beginning. Yeah. And I was tremendously impressed with their gravitas. And so I bought Infosys stock, and it went up 4,000 times, four, not 4,000%, 4, 4,000 times. So I'm super bullish. The Dow Greece is at the opposite extreme. My favorite investment is an area that's been wiped out, destroyed, it's hated, left for dead. There's no speculation. There's no institutions. There's no hot money. Everybody hates it. You mentioned the word, they go, ugh, don't tell me about it. And Greece had the largest decline in GDP uh, in, in the, um, during the sovereign wealth crisis of any country in the last 100 years, greater than in the Depression. And when you look at what's happening, you have a fantastic president who's doing all the right things. They're going to get an investment upgrade. They're paying down their debt. They have the best fiscal situation uh, in the world. Their debt is a maturity of 21 years with an average interest rate of 1.67%. Think about that. 21 years at 1.67%. In other words, impervious to rising interest rates. And they have enough cash in their treasury to pay debt payments for eight years. They're a, 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 a mecca for the green energy revolution. Uh, the, the prime minister is cutting regulations, encouraging foreign investment. You know, I could just go on and on and on. But on the one hand, with India, you have investing in the dynamism of the people who've been held back for thousands of years. And you take off those restraints, and it's unbelievable. And the other is a country that suffered more, had such a wipeout, and the companies that survived are tough and really good. And the people that got through it are tough and really good. So those are the two options that I that I like a lot. And you don't find them often, but when you do, you go all in. And Greece has been a fantastic place to invest. We made a ton of money there. Um, interesting that the prime minister of Greece was a classmate of mine and Dana Schmaltz, who's here with us today at Harvard Business School, and that they've got someone with a business background running the country that has all the signs that you're talking about right now, uh, versus some other countries that are run by politicians and and lifelong bureaucrats. Um, you talk about Greece and how hard times have been in Greece and this rebound on Greece. Um, uranium had a 12-year bear market for uranium, and in 2017, you said this world is changing. Uranium is going to be a needed commodity. And you went long uranium. And I think your index fund on uranium is up 683% since you decided in 2017, after a 12 year bear market in uranium, to go long uranium. What did you see shifting in the global economy to make it so that that bet on uranium has been so strong? Well, that's another example. I mean, a sector that was, uh, I mean, you had Three Mile Island, you had Fukushima, you had the um, Ukrainian nuclear disaster. You had a, a very powerful environmental movement against it. You had the, the, the nuclear uh, companies verge of bankruptcy. I mean, it was, it's a classic situation that I like to look at. And uranium at that time, even today, is selling below the cost of production. If the commodity is selling below the cost of production, there's no incentive to produce more of it. And, you know, the advantages of nuclear are that it's uh, no, no carbons, operating costs are 2%. It doesn't require much land. 
One of the problems, though, is, of course, the cost of construction. So they're now coming up with what these small modular reactors. So let's say an average nuclear plant costs 10 billion US, but these smaller ones could cost maybe 2 billion. And they're faster to construct as sort of a modular. And countries that had turned their back on, on nuclear are, are now going back to it. Japan being an interesting and very strong example. China, of course, is accelerating. India is accelerating. Even the United States is going more that way. I think there are 300 coal utilities in the United States that could be converted into these uh, modular reactors. So everything is aligned uh, beautifully. And even though you're right, it's up seven times what the S&P is uh, during that period, it's still early days, very early days. Yeah, your last letter, you, you, your conviction on this theme is unlimited to the degree that you and your team are sitting there saying, this isn't going to go wrong. There's like nothing that comes between this bet and it paying off. Well, let me tell you a story. So I, one of the things I look for is outlier events. Something that's just unbelievable. I mean, like Saudi Iran. But in 2002, there were 500-year floods in Eastern Europe. 500 years, not 50 or 100, 500 years. Whoa, this is really big. And according to my theory of contagion, if there was another extreme event, that it was a contagion until proven otherwise. And then the next year was hottest weather in France's history. So at that time, I concluded that what was going to force the world to address climate change was these extreme weather events. And, and that is exactly what is going on. They're getting more and more extreme. We're writing this week about the hot weather. This is the hottest July in 10,000 years. And pretty soon it's gonna be so hot, people won't even be able to go outside during the day. And what happens if you don't have air conditioning? And what happens if you do have air conditioning, but you're using more electricity and there's not enough electricity uh, for the grid? So um, I see this as a, as a very powerful ongoing uh, push. And the world is going to have to address this. So your clean energy index fund has also wildly outperformed. When you look at the investments you've made in clean energy, what are the what are the specific areas of clean energy? Is it is it turbine manufacturing? What are the what are the actual companies inside of that clean energy index that you all have identified as being the bets for clean energy? Well, we started um, this this index, if you will, in two thousand one, and uh, I mean the returns are just mind-boggling. And the cost of solar, and, and more importantly, the cost of battery storage was plummeting. It has plummeted. And that was essential. So right now, if I remember correctly, uh, solar is more competitive than everything else in the United States. More competitive than coal, more competitive than gas. Competitive meaning price per yeah. kilowatt? Price, price per kilowatt, yeah. And the battery storage is essential because one of the flaws with non-conventional or clean energy is what happens when the sun doesn't shine? What happens when the wind doesn't blow? So, you know, obviously solar and wind have been key components, but we've also focused on the grid because you can't electrify uh, the world without a grid. And the grid is woefully underinvested. I mean, woefully. And this is also another theme. There's so much that needs to be invested in, and uh, it's not being done. Uh, the green energy metals. I'm diverting here for a second, but BHP is a client of mine. I was speaking to the CEO. He said, the world will run out of copper in 2030. Not that there'll be a shortage. We will run out. And the mining companies need to invest $500 billion between now and then, which they're not doing. 
And you see this in oil, you see this everywhere. It's just underinvestment. And this is another theme of mine. I like to invest in the solution to an economic problem. So if you're, you know, if you want to have a green energy transition because extreme weather events is forcing you to address this, then you're going to have to have enough copper and cobalt and lithium and nickel to make that transition. But there isn't enough. So it's another bottleneck. But the, the, the grid and the, the components of making the grid more effective, efficient, uh, it is a very, very good area. And that's a global phenomenon, not just U.S. And so that's also another theme you have, which is global infrastructure, correct? Uh, no, I would, I would include, include that in the, you know, in the clean energy because it, that's where we, we put it. We put it in the index area. Um, you, for a long time, have focused on and talked about peak oil. Uh, a year ago, right now, oil was at 110 a barrel. We're at 75 a barrel right now. Uh, Where's oil going, Kirill? And are you are you on the short side of that? Or are you long side? Oil is the hardest thing in the world to predict because you've got depletion, which is roughly six seven percent a year. In shale, the de- depletion could be thirty to forty percent. You have geopolitical issues. It, it's very difficult, and I, I don't even attempt to do it except maybe three times in my career. And as you mentioned, in 2002, I became very bullish on oil, having been extremely bearish for the previous two decades. And so I'm familiar with the concept of what we call peak oil, meaning peak oil production. And this is a concept that was originally created by Ken DeFaze, who was a geologist from Texas. And the point is that oil doesn't flow. It's fiscuous. You have to pull it out. Sometimes when you see these geysers, that's because natural gas is there. Uh, but, you know, back when, the, when um, Hubbard was writing, he, he was saying you get 20, 25% of the wells is about as much as you can do. With fracking and other technology, maybe it's 30, 35%. But there is a finite amount because the pressure just isn't there. And so we watched this, and a lot of the oil is produced from fields that have been around for decades, Gawar in Saudi Arabia, 50, 60 years. I mean, that's not going to go on forever. And, you know, there was this view that we were going to have peak oil demand, oil demand in 2019. Well, that's not the case. We have a new high this year. It's forecast another new high next year. And what people don't understand is that Maybe I'm getting too technical here, but in 2004, the OECD oil demand peaked, but emerging oil demand kept soaring. So the oil demand is coming from China and India and Indonesia and and other countries, and it's going to continue because they want the same life that we have. So I think we're going to see much higher oil prices I never, I never predict price. I just study market action. And it looks like the market says it's going higher. It was interesting, you know, prior to the pandemic, there were over 400 oil rigs in the Bakken. That dropped down to 100 during the pandemic. And we're now back to, I believe, about 330 or 350 rigs in the Bakken. Um, how important is the U.S. being oil independent? to our own national security and the overall fiscal policy of the United States? Well, there's a case to be made that oil and oil security is really what drives the world. I mean, you could go back historically for a hundred years and, and make this case. I think, it's, I think it's a good case. And Europe, of course, has no uh, energy self-sufficiency. So it's in a very uh, difficult place. And this is where I come back to the Middle East and OPEC at the moment, OPEC plus has never had more power. They, they control 60% of global oil production and they're working together for once because they have a common interest. So it looks to me like uh, if, if you have, can have energy security, you're going to aim for it. 
which is another driving force, of course, behind nuclear, because the uranium is, is, is such a small part of the price, even if you had to pay astronomical levels, it wouldn't be, be very costly. You talk about Europe when you, when you talk about oil and uh, oil dependence and the war in Ukraine, um, it makes you think about the broader theme of defense spending. In your last letter, you talk about the fact that in either 2023, I believe it is, the world is going to spend $2.2 trillion on defense spending. Um, you have an index fund that's focused on increased defense spending going forward. How does one play that? Do you just you know, buy the big U.S. defense contractors? Or is the, is the landscape of defense investment changing so rapidly that you've got to look beyond the typical names? I would go beyond the typical names. South Korea is becoming a very important supplier, and it's a very interesting uh, companies there. Uh, India is trying to become an important supplier. Uh, what's driving it is really uh, self-sufficiency and security, and it's what's driving a lot of things in the world. And the uh, Japan, uh, massive increase in defense spending. And Europe, massive increase in defense spending. So I think last year, defense spending was up 3.7%. But in Europe, in some countries, it was up 30%. Now, granted, from a low base, but I don't see this changing anytime soon. So it's, you know, it's a geopolitical stress issue as the unipolar world starts to wobble and the dependency on the United States becomes less uh, secure, countries are going to want to be self-sufficient in security. Is there anything there, Kirill, as it relates to sort of, if you will, the competitive advantage that some of the large U.S. defense contractors or Boeing, for instance, have on a global scale that nobody else really, while they may be making a certain munition and a certain technology at a small level, when you get to something like aircraft manufacturing, we've just got such a competitive advantage over the rest of the world that that will continue to grow? Well, it's interesting that, of course, the technology is changing dramatically. So drones are now huge, and that's going to change the nature of warfare. And, and hypersonic vehicles and blocking um, GPS signals. So there's so much going on in terms of, of new technology that it's moving very fast. And the hypersonic vehicle, to me, is an amazing creation. I mean, I don't know if I've got the number quite right, but it could travel from Beijing to Washington, D.C. in an hour, two hours, uh, and beneath the radar. So there are all these things that are going on, and it's always technology and military that gives you the edge. And if you look at Europe, the reason why he was able to dominate the world for so long was because it had superior military technology. <laughs> it's not complicated. I want to just to completely off of your research and really big issues, but by you saying blocking GPS signals, um, I had a friend of mine who was in Paris two weeks ago and sat down at dinner at a table next to Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. And um, they had a security detail around them. And uh, the security detail came over to their table as they pulled out their phones to take a picture and said, no pictures. And so the meal goes on, everyone's having a good time. And my friend at the end of the meal thinks that she can sneak in a picture. And so she picks up her phone and goes like this, Toby Maguire and Leonardo are sitting right where you are. And she goes, boom, like that. And the image that showed up on her phone was a blue screen. And there's a technology that's been developed for stars where they can put it on their table. And the moment that a, that a camera goes off around them, it zaps some signal that makes it so that the camera doesn't pick up the image. Uh, it's down at our level, if you will, as far as taking selfies in the world. But I was pretty amazed. She sent me the copy of it. And it's just a blue blur. And she said, this is three feet away from Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. Some kind of technology stepped in and blurred my phone. Um, you talked about um, you talked about Saudi Arabia and other currencies. 
um, and you are big on de-dollarization. And talk for a moment about what's happening as it relates to A, how lucky we are that we are the fiat currency today and what you see happening going forward as it relates to the strength of the dollar and competitors to the dollar. Well, there are a lot of moving parts on this. So one, one point is that the U.S. is the largest debtor in the history of you know, finance. It's 18 or 19 trillion net is owed to far, foreigners. So let's put that over there. Can I pause for one second on that? Sorry. Just the point that Kirill just made is really important to remember. You hear this number, 32 trillion of debt outstanding. That's the aggregate number. But he just went to the net net debt number because between 32 trillion and 18 trillion is money we owe ourselves. So that's intergovernmental debt and that's debt held by the Federal Reserve. And so the net net debt number is the $18 trillion number that Kirill just said, not the headline number that many of us see, which is $32 trillion. Sorry to interrupt. Well, um, I know I agree with you on that, but I was saying something a little bit different. Because of balance of payments deficits for 50 years, the U.S. has run up debts that are, that are owed to foreigners. And a lot of that is in the form of treasuries and, and other uh, other ways. So then you had the confiscation of the Russian foreign exchange reserves. Whether you think it's warranted or not, it was a watershed moment. I mean, I was with the CIO of Julius Baer, who was jumping up and down on the table, screaming and said, this is the worst thing for intellectual property and property rights that has ever happened. And any country that has treasuries is thinking, you know, I'm you know, I have to do a lot of business with China. Suppose the U.S. says to me, you can't trade with China. And they have this tool that, that they, can, they can confiscate my treasuries. I'm not saying it's realistic, but if you're, if you're practical and pragmatic, you say, well, maybe I should reduce my holdings, which is going on globally. And I was in Singapore on the day that the Singapore Monetary Authority announced the purchase of 45 tons of gold. I would not have chosen Singapore as a country that I thought was going to be buying lots of gold. And I was with two prominent Indian business people, one of whom was building um, grain storage so that India could double its, its food storage capacity. I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, India will see this decision by Singapore as an attempt to de-dollarize. So many countries, central banks are buying, are buying gold. So you've got that. But let's, let's look at the long-term picture of the fiscal situation of the U.S. The entitlements plus interest based on CBO forecasts show that in 2040, which is like, you know, that's tomorrow, the U.S. budget would be entirely eaten up by entitlements and interest. And anybody who is paying attention is looking at that and saying, that's a train wreck. I want out of here before that crashes. So there are all these factors going on. And then you have what I would argue is probably, you know, the old story about taking the well, uh, taking the, the, uh, the pot too many times to the well that it breaks. You know, the U.S. has, you know, I think there's, 30% of the world's countries are under some kind of sanctions. And it just goes on and on. And countries are, are tired of it. And they, they don't want to be aligned. They don't want to be, be involved with politics and geopolitics. We just want to trade. We want to have a prosperous economy. So there's a move to, to de-dollarize and have a new monetary system. So all these things are happening at the same time. You're your gold index as it relates to investment in gold has not performed that well. Your gold miners index has performed brilliantly. So just as it relates to the actual bullion that's out there versus the gold, is that just a time lag that the miners are, are, are pulling it out of the ground and doing well now and the actual currency trading on gold hasn't kind of caught up with the movement that we're looking at? Well, I think gold is about about to break out of a of a triple top, and silver is going to lead the way. Uh, 
Gold, I've studied gold my entire career, and it confuses people because they say, well, why didn't gold do better when inflation arrives? And I argue that gold anticipated the arrival of inflation. And I've argued for decades that gold is the best barometer of inflation and deflation. And gold peaked in the last rally in August, September of 2020, which was before the inflation began. But it bottomed in 2015 when deflationary forces were at their most extreme. And it started to trend up in anticipation of inflation. And what he's saying now is that the Fed is going to have to capitulate, whether it's because the dollar is getting weak, whether it's because there's a, something gets broken, whatever the reason, and I'm just studying the markets, uh, this is what it's saying. Gold shares are largely owned by U.S. investors who don't like gold. You know, FDR confiscated gold in 1934. So it's a very volatile vehicle. But when they go, they really go. They go up 10 times more than the billion. So I think you need to be in both. You talk about inflation and gold being, if you will, the, the, the investment prior to the inflationary pressures. Um, in your last letter, you talk about the fact that you think that the Federal Reserve does not have the strength to take rates to where rates need to go and that they accept higher inflation. That's a, that's a, that, that given everything that we've heard from Jerome Powell and seen the Fed say, that's quite a contradictory statement on your part that they will capitulate and say, we're good with 4% inflation because we just can't take the pain of the Fed funds rate sitting at pick your number. Talk about that for a moment. Well, I long for the day when central bankers are no longer rock stars. I long for the day when you get back to a time when every FOMC member is speaking, and I'm just so sick of it. And I like to get back to an earlier time when they just keep their mouths shut. But until they no longer are rock stars, this is what we have to put up with. And uh, I interviewed Lacey Hunt, who I consider the greatest monetary economist in the United States. Lacey uh, Hunt is from where? Sorry. Um, he, he is the chief economist for Hoisington Capital Management, but he worked at the Dallas Fed. He's a great historian. He's a Renaissance man. He's brilliant. And um, so I interviewed him, and he made the point that there's group think at the Fed. I think you Somebody yeah, this, Lineman, Lineman is Lineman, very, Peter this Lineman, is not an exactly. original statement. No, no, no. It's very obvious. It's just and, nice to hear really smart people reinforcing that statement. And he he cited an example of somebody uh, who went around and interviewed people um, independent of where they were as a group, and they always had a different opinion than they did with the group. With the group, they all want to be in agreement. Now, the Greenspan Fed was encouraging dissent, but since Bernanke had been trying to encourage you know, unity, and uh, you know, you've got, they're all educated in the same place, they all think the same way, they all look the same statistics. But Lacey's point is that they may not understand what money is. And this is one thing that Paul Volcker did understand and Milton Friedman did understand. But if you don't understand what money is, you don't know when you've gone too far. And this is the risk that they may have gone too far and therefore they're gonna to have to backpedal and try to solve another crisis that they have created time and time and time again. They create the crisis and they come back and then they create another crisis and, then, and on and on and on until it ends somewhere. But so your bet, Kirill, is just that they won't have the stomach to hold rates at this higher rate for a longer period of time and they will cut? Well, you know, I honestly don't know the answer. But what, what I'm doing is looking at what the markets are saying. Right. And the markets are saying, you know, here we are. I mean, maybe this could be a global recession. Maybe there isn't. I mean, I don't have any idea. But you know, energy energy starting to catch on fire and other aspects of the commodity sector are looking stronger and stronger. 
gold, you, you know, is, I would argue, on the verge of a, of a breakout. There is confirmation that something is going on here. And it certainly, you know, it means a weaker dollar. And you got a weaker dollar only because the Fed has to cut rates or is, is done or virtually done. So final area is your automation index. Your automation index has done extremely well. It's up 550% since you created the index. Um, on automation, is the is the gain in the United States as it relates to the automation index, or is that a more back to our defense manufacturing being a global play? You, you're, you're very globally focused. If you're going to play on the automation side, is, is the game in the U.S., or is it actually outside of the U.S.? Well, I think it, it really has to be uh, be a, a global. There are a lot of um, a lot of interesting things going on in other parts of the world, but this is, of course, also the the artificial intelligence, uh, which is you know very significant part of this, and you know, we we think that a lot of technologies are merging together at the same time that has never happened before, which is going to accelerate all these trends even faster and make them more more um, extreme in their impact on the world. As you look out and say, okay, I mean, your time horizon has always been so long and it's one of the reasons you've been such a successful investor. You get conviction on certain themes, you invest in them and you watch them and you stay with them. Um, as you look out over the next five years, we've talked about a number of your high conviction themes. Anything that the two of us haven't touched upon that this audience ought to be thinking about? Well, I think that the risk for everybody in this room is the dollar gets very weak. You know, I, I'm agnostic. You know, I, I could be a dollar bull, I could be a dollar bear. I just think there are so many forces that are causing the dollar to get weak. And Stan Dockermiller caused, caused the, uh, the reserve currency a, as the curse of the reserve currency. So the U.S. does not have to discipline itself. It could just keep on borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. I mean, we've never run debt deficits ever to the extent we're doing it, it, with this strong economy it's been you know, in the past few years. So you look at that and you just say, where, where is that going to go? So, And is there any, I mean, as I hear that, I say, okay, well, does that mean buy euros? Does that mean buy crypto? What is the, what are the, I get the dollar, the, the loss of value in the dollar and what that means for the U.S. economy, but as an investor, what's the alternative? Like what comes to replace it? Is it crypto? Is it the euro? Or is it this new currency that's being cooked up by Saudi Arabia, Russia, and China to try and displace the dollar, which by the way, as you well know, is less than 1% of global capital flows today. So, I mean, you know, you look at this chart of the dollar and everything else and the dollar just is so large and so dominant that, yeah, it might be a long-term trend of a weakening dollar, but where do you, how do you play that? Well, it's, if you get a weaker dollar, you're going to have inflation and there's going to be a push into hard assets. So the flip side of strong dollar is I want to be in, in hard assets, meaning commodities, gold, silver, copper, all those things. So commodity currencies, certainly uh, Canada, Australia, uh, what have you. Um, and we like the Middle East because they're just investing, and it's, it's going to be a, a Europe of the Middle East where you can travel visa-free. They're trying to encourage trade. You know, all the things you're, you're seeing there. So that whole sector should, should do extremely well. So that's one area I like. Uh, food security, we've been blessed with good weather and incredibly productive farmers. But, you know, then you have bad weather. And then you have uh, Ukraine, and topsoil is being eroded at unbelievable rates. And it takes 70 years to create topsoil. The world is, wants more protein and nourishment. 
So their their diet is 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 increasing in, in calories, and then there's uh, growth in all these countries that they want a better life, and that means better food. So it, it looks to me like that whole sector is really, really attractive, really attractive. So my final question for you, Carol, um, you have been wildly successful. And as a result of that, you can live your life where you want to live your life. Uh, and from just my uh, perch, you, you, you have properties in Canada, in Idaho, in the Bahamas, in the Adirondacks and in Europe. And where you spend your time, given all of these global threats to me is a really good indicator of what you're seeing. And so where are you gonna spend the next 25 years? Well, I think a lot about personal security and family security. And we were worrying about uh, pandemics for 20 years. So I bought this farm in Canada. It's self-sufficient, uh, off the grid. My home in the Bahamas is off the grid. My home here has a generator with gas from uh, Wyoming can go for forever. Um, you know, I have years and years supply of food. There's no downside to this stuff, right? Except having a home in Canada that you couldn't get to during well, the pandemic. Right. <laughs> but th this brings you to the optionality. You need to have all these options so that if one falls out down, then, then something else comes in. I would not have thought of the Bahamas as a safe haven but during COVID, it proved it, it got to COVID phenomenally well. So it went up and Canada, Canada uh, went down. So, I mean, if we think about this, just look at what's happening in the world today with the heat. In some parts of the world, it's, it's 45, 65, 85 degrees uh, centigrade. You can't live like that. And the water is in the wrong places. And then food security, social unrest, so all these factors need to be evaluated. We all love where we're living, but we have to be realistic that maybe you have to change. Now, I lived in South Florida for a while, and I left in 2010, and now it's an accident waiting to happen. And I, I know what it's like if you're trying to drive north uh, from Miami with a hurricane approaching. You're just not going to get anywhere. And, of course, the, 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 uh, the gasoline stations run out of fuel, and when the power goes out, you can't get any gasoline, but no one thinks about these things. No one is prepared for any of these things. And I'm always thinking, what if? What are the big risks? And uh, you know, through AI and other things, we, we're monitoring. So with COVID, maybe pandemics were number 20, and all of a sudden we read what's going on in China, said, okay, it's number one now. You know, let's swing into action with our long plan. What do we do in a pandemic? But this is not being done. It seems to me this is 101 uh, pragmatism and um, being prepared for the future. So the short answer is, um, if it's going to get hotter and hotter, you want to be in the mountains, at the, you know, it's going to be cooler there. So this is a, a really good place. The Adirondacks is deep forests. You know, it's, it's a rainforest there. It's a perfect refuge. Bahamas, you know, you got hurricanes. Uh, you know, Switzerland is a phenomenal place, but the glaciers are melting. I mean, there's no perfect place. So you have to just keep evaluating based on new information and shift. And, you know, I'm very flexible this way, but I love optionality. So I love the fact that you have optionality and for all of us in the room, I hope that your optionality doesn't have to be exercised upon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Kirill Sokolov. Thank you. It's great. It's really great.